It was her first, um, it was her first romance, and it won the favourite Australian contemporary romance in 2012. She was voted number 13 of Booktopia's favourite Australian author poll in 2018. A pretty impressive achievement for someone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> in fairly early in a writing career. The Patterson Girls won the 2016 Romance Writers of Australia Ruby Award and also the 2015 Australian Book Industry Award for General Fiction. Um, so please make um, Rachel welcome. She's here today with her book. It's called The Greatest Gift. And Christine, sitting here, me, Christine Wells is a best-selling author of historical fiction about smart, strong female protagonists. She sold over 180,000 copies worldwide of her book, and her most recent novel, The Juliet Code, was inspired by the true story of a female spy in World War II. Please welcome Christine Wells. <laughs> and Victoria Perman, on the end there, where Victoria, she is a multi-published, award-nominated, Amazon Kindle, best-selling author. That sounds like a Kinder profile. <laughs> <laughs> I am so clear on I'm swiping her. Uh, she is the Vice President of the Romance Writers of Australia and a long-standing member of the Writers South Australian Board until earlier this year. She is a regular guest at Writers Festivals, a mentor, workshop presenter, has been nominated for a number of Readers' Choice Awards and was a judge in the fiction category for the 2018 Adelaide Festival Awards for Literature. Please welcome Victoria with her book. So if you have the other phone fill up to the phone fill up, bottom fill up. Well, I'm sorry, I'm I was actually telling Victoria before we get into this the story I want to tell you. I, 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 in reading all the books um, um, for, for the writers' fest, so I got Victoria's book a little bit later. So I had a week to finish it in, and, and the other night I was finishing it. You know, I had to prepare your panel, so I, I like to have at least you know five or six days to, to, to do that. So I had to read the book in the sitting, and my husband had gone to tennis. He came home. I was so engrossed in the book. I didn't even see him come into the room. Um, I just sort of noticed it out of the side. I didn't speak to him. It was 10 o'clock by that stage. He must have gone to bed. Uh, at 11.30, when I turned the light off and finished the book, I noticed he was asleep next to me and couldn't really remember how he got there. <laughs> and so then I rolled over to give him a hug, um, thinking his back was to me, but it wasn't. His front was, and I punched him really hard in the door. <laughs> Which I told Victoria before, and she says every woman should finish her her book with a good ball punch. <laughs> That's what you've done to women. <laughs> so, um, so it's just, it's fine. I quit on laughing. <laughs> I'm never going to laugh. No, people, it was a home invasion. <laughs> Me. So um, we're going to start with kissing and then move on to more serious stuff. <laughs> That's what usually happens. Um, so let, let's, I, I want to start off by meeting each of these authors and telling, telling each of the audience about their first kiss, that they had in re, their real life first kiss. I don't even know you were supposed to open your mouth. I just want you to put your lips together and <laughs> Victoria, do you want to start with your first kiss? Wow. <laughs> I was 15. Um, he was about 24. Oh, wow. I have to say that at the time I thought it was really romantic, on the back of a motorbike. But actually, with Mandy and I, so I looked back and thought, it's kind of creepy, actually. <laughs> yeah, and, and I didn't speak a word of German, he didn't speak a word of English. It was a perfect relationship. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, I, I've got terrible memory, but I think it was um, 
yeah, the movies, and I don't know who put the moves on first, but it probably was me, as I said, because I think he just was like, okay, I'll just kiss her because then she'll shut up and maybe leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's so there, there are your first kisses. So let's, um, I, I'd like you now to, to share, um, and whilst I should actually mention to um, the, the each of these three novels, although um, all the writers here. Um, write in romance fiction. These are, these are all stories of, um, this, is, this is Greatest Gift is very much a story of, of a beautiful friendship relationship and about working towards having a baby and and, so, and, and the deeper impacts of surrogacy on family and, and, and expanding love that way. Um, Christine's book, The Juliet Code, as is, is about the spy. She's just an absolutely fantastic, so great seeing the female protagonist take charge of the narrative. Um, as she does in that, and have the man kind of a little bit wimpy hiding in my room. He's not wimpy, he's lovely. He is lovely. Anyway, you probably just need a good punch to the ball. <laughs> and of course, the Ben Gillard Girls, which is an is a, a amazing story of Australian history, um, you know, set around um, migrant um, Australians and, and young women and their friendships as they came post World War II. Um, into Bongilla and, and where they went after that and how their stories evolved. So love is, is at the heart of all the stories, friendship, love, um, and, and kind of, you know, epic stories of people's lives. So within that, there are also kisses. Uh, so I asked each of the writers, because it is called And Then He Kissed Me, um, to share. Um, it is quite a heterosexual statement, isn't it? Um, <laughs> or not. Or not. Yeah. 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 Uh, assuming that could be two blokes. That's right. um, so if you'd like to share your kids, your kids stories, do you want to start, Rachel? Sure. Your kids scenes. Um, I just have to quickly say that this is at a hookup party and neither the male or the female that in the situation that are in this kiss uh, actually want to be at the hookup party. I don't know what a hookup party is like either, but I was looking for ways my characters could meet. And someone mentioned that they'd met their partner at a hookup party, so it's where you go along and you bring another single friend, and then, you know, so they've both been come, coming along as the, the other person and they don't want to be there, so. A bit like here. <laughs> the writer's <laughs> festival. Thanks. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, <laughs> you like a hookup party. We'll pay you later. <laughs> um, after a few moments of silence, Jasper said, I'm sorry, when you come to a hookup party, the last thing you probably want to do is talk about babies. Ignoring the latter part of his statement, she smiled. Actually, this isn't really my scene. I came kicking and screaming with my flatmate. Hey, I don't suppose you could kiss me. I'd be happy with a peck on the cheek, but I promised her I wouldn't leave without being a snob or at least five phone numbers, and I really want to bail this party. <laughs> he leaned across the table, and before she could tell him it was a joke, he pressed his mouth against hers in the most gentle but titillating kiss she'd had in her entire life. Her nipples tingled, her toes curled, and that tender spot between her legs flooded with warmth. And then he pulled back. Her cheeks burning, she tried to catch her breath as she met his still smiling gaze. Thank you, she whispered, resisting the urge to kiss him again. Suddenly she couldn't even recall the name of the TV show she'd forgotten to come here. Always happy to help out a lady. <laughs> yeah. That is a really nice kiss. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think I have a tingle as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Remember that. 
the uncharacteristic steel in his tone made her want to break from him and run. That was so beautiful. Um, <laughs> the might be a little bright. <laughs> but it is that, that thing of, of pain and, and loss and trying to find your ability to be intimate again, to let go. And, and Victoria, your kid? Um, I just need to set this up a little bit. Who knows what Bonagilla migrant camp is? Yeah. Yeah. Who was there? I ask that question because often I get show of hands, it's incredible. But it was a place that migrants came in the post-war period and it wasn't a, they could leave. I mean, so they, it was a temporary housing facility really. It was an old army camp and they would stay there until they found work somewhere else. But the, the book starts in 1954. I just want to set that up because my, the two characters in this scene, one um, is an Australian born woman and the other, and the man is Italian and he's Catholic and she's not. So I want you to cast your mind back to that era when um, the pit one people didn't kiss. Mm -hmm. uh, but two, the, the social structures of the time that meant that for a whole lot of reasons that relationship couldn't happen. Um, so this, that, the, the two people met in 1954 and this is in the 70s when they had met again. Frances pressed her, pressed her breasts against his shirt, laid her hands on his shoulders. She was so relieved when he didn't back away this time, when he stayed close, when he lost his breath at the nearness of her. There was a moment of guilty hesitation and then he slipped a warm hand inside her top, covering her breast and then his lips were on her neck, pressing there. She wanted one thing from this man, another kiss, but not like the chaste one they'd shared when she'd been eight months pregnant with another man's baby. Kiss me, Massimo, please, just one more time. He pulled back, taking her face in his hands. His chest rose and fell, and she could feel that he was hard, pressing against her. She needed him to close the book on the longing she'd had for him all these years, for the memories that wouldn't fade, for the life she sometimes wished she had. We can't do this, he murmured. It's not right. Frances stood on her toes and put her mouth on his, slowly, hesitantly, tasting him, feeling the soft fullness, the desire for her. She undid his belt. I know, Francis whispered into his lips. Oh. And that's why I put you off with the balls. I was waiting for that scene. The whole book, the tension I had. <laughs> it was kind of true, because I was like, hey, surely something. So what is it, uh, um, as, as writers of, um, of romance and love and, and, and story, what are some of the challenges in creating that kind of sexual tension throughout and where you, and where, where, how you actually release that in your writing to, to, to propel the story? Do you, is, there, is there sort of a, you know, are you aware as you're building towards that and not letting the, write the reader off too early? But I think you have to, I mean, if they got together on page two, there'd be no book, right? Mm. Um, but I think what we all do is throw in real life circumstances that keep people apart. And you don't have to look very far in our own lives, the lives of our friends or family, or in my case, recent social history. There are reasons why people couldn't be together. So that's, you know, that's what you want, is to find those reasons why those two people can't be together at the time you start for. Just to say, it's a little bit harder sometimes in contemporary fiction, because you don't have some of the historical constraints yeah. that you might have um, then. But in terms of, I guess, building up the, the tension and the page turning, and I mean, those, these aren't straight romances. In, in the romances we do, um, everyone knows often who the hero and heroine are, but it's the ride and the journey you go on and you want them to get together. So you have to sort of create that, um, you know, the, the reader wants them to be together, but you're gonna keep them apart. But I think the whole setting up the sexual tension, it's just little things that people do, like a, you know, a long glance or a, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's noticing all those little things about the other person that can really build tension, just not really saying, oh, he's so hot, I'm, you know, it's it's not over, it's this, every move they make, You're the other of. person notices. But I'm lucky, I've got, well, my historical romance was set in Regency England, so, you know, uh, there was a wonderful writer called Loretta Chase who made an incredibly mm. hot scene and all the hero did was take off the heroine's glove. <laughs> the whole scene. Yeah, often, I guess, read it. Yeah, often um, being, it doesn't have to, you don't have to go the whole way in a book, you can close the door and it can be, right, you know, just as sexy as a, a full-blown love scene. 
And, and I think words are sexy too. Mm. I mean, they're my favourite things to write. People talking to each other and you know, getting to know each other. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. and you can write, the, you know, the, the, the feeling off of a glove. It's in the actions and it's in the, the way they're talking to each other or maybe even not talking to each other. They're yes. fun things to write. Hard, they're hard to, to get it right. They take a lot of work, don't they? So here we are at a, uh, a writer's festival and um, talking with uh, one of the predominantly romance writers. And are there assumptions about what the content and who the readers are of romantic fiction? Oh, go on, Victoria. <laughs> because there is... Yeah. Uh, okay, we are really dumb. We don't understand real literature. We are looking for a guilty pleasure read. Um, you know, on, on and we on. We just turn the books out. We just turn the books out. Oh, we must like to succeed with our husband. I think it's very much how to get home. I should ask that on radio once. Has someone actually asked you that it's wish? On radio. What? If you practice the scenes out? And my husband said, you should say our real life is hotter than anything. <laughs> <laughs> My husband gets up, we used to own a small town supermarket, um, so small town, 500 people, uh, so everyone knows everybody else, and you know, people would read my books and then come in to my husband and, well, their wife is reading, <laughs> and they'd come in and go, oh, so, you know, so this is your real life. But also, I think there's not just, definitely, not just female readers that read uh, my books, and I believe, I actually, I'll admit that when I first um, started writing romance, one, I had the kind of misconception that a lot of people do about romance. I, I wasn't one of those, um, I wasn't a big reader in childhood for a start, and my mum didn't read romance novels, so I didn't, a lot of romance writers I know, they said they sneakily sell their parents' romance novels and stuff, so that's how they got to them. I didn't, and for some reason I had this conception that they're all, uh, you know, heaving bosoms and throbbing bandwoods and <laughs> trash, um, and I don't, honestly don't know where I got that from. And then I started reading them, and I realised that maybe once upon a time, but it's not at all what I imagined. Um, and I have many readers who are male who will email, they like our Facebook pages, and then I've met many of them at events, and they're not necessarily what you would think, you know, a male reader of romance would be. They're very, very just like any reader of anything. So I think there's a whole load of yeah, myths about romance, and most people that are quick to have a laugh about it have never actually read one, or if they have, it was 40 years ago. Or, or they are reading them and just don't know it. Yes. So <laughs> <laughs> there are plenty of classics that mm. have a romance structure. It's really a structure. So, yeah, and what is the romance structure? It, it's your character arc, like the reward for you moving through your character arc, overcoming whatever's stopping you moving forward with your life. The reward is the happy ending with mm. your partner and the two of you have to do it at the same time. Yeah. It's hard to write. <laughs> it yeah. is because I, I also had that misconception about, oh, I did a literary degree at uni writing and stuff and I, that's what everyone thought I should be writing. Um, whereas I love reading Bridget Jones' diary and stuff like that. So I was trying to write what other people thought I should be writing. Um, and then I thought, oh, you know what, I'm going to just write a Mills and Boone. Yeah, that, that's finally going to get published. It's not easy to write a Mills and Boone. Uh, it's a very hard craft. Um, and it took me, well, I didn't get published in Mills and Bean, um, and this, that wasn't my first uh, published book. So it took me about six more years after really learning the craft of romance. I'm a slow learner, maybe other people will be quicker. But like, it's not that easy thing. And I'm very, you know, respectful of any genre, but um, nothing's easy in your writing. I, I think people mix up the conventions of a genre with the um, you know, with judgments about its value. Mm. I mean, I love reading crime too. Mm. Crimes end with a resolution to the mystery, right? Or you're disappointed. Oh, and no, <laughs> don't you hate it when they don't? You go, yeah. oh. But no one sits back at the end of a crime and goes, oh, that's such a cliche, they found the murderer. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Yeah.
think there's a little bit of a snobbery within crime as well uh, against the cosy mysteries, which mm -hmm. tend to be more domestic based <laughs> as well. So yeah, crime, crime fiction has this aura of being social commentary because you know, he's walking the mean streets and, mm -hmm. uh, and all that sort of thing. But there are plenty of issues that are raised and dealt with in romance as well. Yeah. There you have. So in, I love that. It's kind of like, I love the internal sense of the politics within writing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The politics of, um, you know, of within. We could actually prepare a book at a writer's festival. Yeah. Where perhaps... <laughs> <laughs> a, bit of, a bit of crime and romance. Yeah, yeah. some like one of your authors is gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> as long as we know at the end of the session who did it. <laughs> <laughs> and then they got married. Yeah, kiss the make off. They're not in the signing tent. Um, <laughs> we should call it the signing tent. <laughs> <laughs> About the, the, yeah. the stories about women being you know, diminished or yeah. um, like, you know, um, it's not seen as relevant for. I think we're seeing that across our whole community, our whole yeah. society. And women are standing up and saying, actually, no, my stories are important too. Mm -hmm. I heard a bit of Anne Ali this morning, um, and she was yeah. saying, who, when she was asked to write a memoir, she said, why is my story important? And she said, your story is really important. Because we are sort of socialised to believe that what the stories of women are. Mm -hmm. Um, and their other, or so the, yeah. the eternal lives of women. And my book's about four women who have a 50 year long friendship and that they overcome issues of race, migration, um, ever, you know, family dramas. And believe me, they're all based on things that happen in my extended family that you might recognise. I mean, mm -hmm. children out of wedlock and affairs and all those things. We know family, we know these, these things happen in families. Why, why are those stories less important than? than a dead woman in another book. Okay. Yeah, ex exactly. And also writing about one of the themes that you have, um, you know, all picked up on, you know, very strongly in all your books is female friendship mm -hmm. and and the power of that within within um, storytelling. And it is a very underexplored, um, it felt like a really, you know, it's really exciting to read a book where I'm as much interested in the story of these evolving female friendships than, than anything else. Is that is that is the, is the role of female friendship something you were focused on? And not making women adversarial yeah, all I the think time? So. I mean, we are all members also of Romance Writers Australia. And I think the majority of like, people might think there's male, there's male members in there, but um, <laughs> <Sorry. a> few, <laughs> a few, a few. <laughs> but the majority is definitely women. And you know, you might think, oh, you know, we've got a female workplace or something like that, that everyone's all reaching and stuff. But I don't, that's not the, you know, that's not most people's experience of it. And I think, you know, yeah, we're so quick to think on females as being bitchy, but my female friendships are really important to me. And I think they're important to most women that I know, whether it's across generations or people I went to school with. And like, I, I think all my books are their romance or, um, what we call women's fiction, don't get me started on that term, but um, are, are about relationships. And that's something that everybody in the world can relate to. Um, you know, that has just been a romantic, romantic relationship, but we've all had good or bad relationships. And so, yeah, and the issues you said about, you know, all those family issues, we've all been in some kind of family. So I think uh, what we do call women's fiction, um, you know, most people can relate to it, hence why there's probably male readers that are sneakily written. <laughs> Well, they need to read women's fiction to have a bit of an idea about women, too. It doesn't hurt. Yes. Uh, and they do, and they do read it. And I have people say, oh, I'm going to give my husband your book to read when he gets my yeah. yeah, I've got, I've got a lot of men who are reading the Juliet Code despite the big female face on the cover. They never go and buy it yeah. because it looks like a girl's book. But, uh, you know, there are lots of uh, real characters from real life in it and it's World War II, they're all, it's about spies, they love that. Uh, and yeah. I've got a bit of a role reversal going on in my book and the, the girls team up and break into the special operations executive files and it's kind of like the hijinks that you expect the men to get up to. And I've got the, the male staying at home, receiving the wireless transmissions and, and the female agent going out into danger. 
Tell me too about um, what's really interesting is that you've all written very strong female um, main characters. The protagonists have heaps of agency about what they do. And that also breaks with the, I suppose, what might be the assumption of people who don't read the genre widely or the stereotypes that the women are sad, submissive little girls that stay at home and wait for big, handsome, broken men. <laughs> As we do. <laughs> So I'm interested in 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 the um how, how you've evolved your female protagonists, have you, in relation to the reader, or are these are these the women that you have long told the stories of? Can I search for I forget for the memory? I just write real women who I feel like these are the people that I know in everyday life. I mean, obviously they're a little bit more larger than life, but I don't see these. The majority of females I know are smart and they don't send the, you know, they don't need a man to send to rely on and everything. So I think I've always just written what I would like to be in a person. And so I've never seen that in any books I read or any books I like that. Um, I, my first book was published in 2012, and um, I would never have dreamed of writing any character who wasn't a feminist. Yeah. Because that's just, as Rachel said, it's me and it's my contemporaries, and it's, I'm, I'm not afraid to say I'm 53, so I grew up in the sort of formative 70s and 80s, and you know, the fight was on back then. It sort of changed for women a bit now, but no. no. But Mr. Darcy is lovely to watch if it's from the <laughs> She was, but you know, we if we sometimes romanticise that kind of you know dark, damaged man, really in real life, you kick him to the curb and up. Uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the first historical romance a heroine I wrote to manage her grandfather's estate, pretty much single-handedly. So, uh, yeah, she was. She pretty much had a job before the hero came along. Uh, and I think maybe the men have changed a little bit. Mm. Uh, in the Juliet Code, I was certain that the big strapping SAS guy was going to be the love interest. And it just didn't work out that way. Felix is a creator. So you didn't know? No. So you were, you were discovering who she was interested in as you were writing? Yeah. Oh, that's that must be exciting, turning up to the keyboard. <laughs> 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 that's exactly how I do it. <laughs> Men that are emerging in, in these stories, and what do they look like? 
prostate questions. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of those terrible questions people do. Can you talk It's a really good question. And, you know, there's the people familiar with the term the alpha man and the beta man, right? The alpha is the Mr. Darcy. You know? I, I don't write those characters. Um, I write the, the kind of gentler men, I suppose. Um, because that's the kind of bloke I like. I mean, that's my fantasy on the page. <laughs> I turn up at the keyboard and go, whoop. I've got a feeling there's a lot of gentlemen here. Yeah. And if you're in this panel, good for you. Yeah. Yeah. Put up the side. I'm going to put you, you two in the front row. <laughs> Never write a character that has not given her consent, but it's it's not you know, written in the page because you don't want that sort of. No, 
Um, but I think it's the way you write. It's obvious that these people have the hots for each other. And, you know, um, it is hard these days. And I have three boys. And they, you know, we all have boys, actually. And I know you want to give them this sort of information. But at the same time, it, it's sort of, I feel like, you were saying that we have but I feel like it's um, something you should know, you should learn, and it, it should be you should be able to read people's like body language and how they're feeling. So it's it's hard. I mean, I think you get that across on the page without necessarily um, you know, yeah, paint them saying black and white. I know. Victoria, um, that's right. You mentioned I have three sons, and they're not here, so I can talk about them. <laughs> <laughs> made a little so I can talk about them. Um, and my um, middle one is 21 now, and I remember having this. With him, and he's, he's quite open. And I said, I have to tell you, Ned, that's not his real name. <laughs> I, said, I have to tell you, Ned, that he has had his first girlfriend. And I said, At any time she says stop, that means stop. Um, and he said, Oh, yeah, of course. I said, No, no, even if it makes you unhappy, and even if you don't want to stop, that means stop. And it struck me in that moment that it's, we should always been have been having those discussions with our sons. So I, I, that's what I love about the Me Too movement. And I think, and that's something I would have, I've always reflected on my characters. Not that they ever want the men to stop because they only exactly. have to, you know. Yeah. And, and that's part of the build up. But, you know, if it was, I think it, there's a way to be implicit um, or explicit actually um, about that stuff without, you know, is it okay if I touch you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Like, because I just 
and they don't see romance like that at all. Like I've never, none of the romances I've read, or even older ones. I think it's the image that people have, but it's just never been. I, I don't feel like it's like that. Mm. Uh, no, I certainly. I'm not, no, and, and that's a perception that people have about romance, and people will see a cover, and you know, especially historical fiction. Um, you know, there's a there's a look to a cover, just as there there's a look to a crime cover. You know, it tells the reader it's a promise to the reader about what's between the pages. So, um, I mean, and Mills and Burn is a good example of Rachel was mentioning before. That people might look at the titles if you go into your discount department store and look at the titles. It's easy to go, oh, 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 the billionaire's baby dog or whatever it is. <laughs> But if you read the pages, the billionaire's off on the woman. Yeah. You know? yeah. Like, it, so they, they, it, that's marketing. Yeah, Mills and Bean's definitely moved with the triangles. Oh, yeah. You know, so the, they're subversive within that kind of, within the space they occupy, and, and readers wouldn't put up with any of that. I reckon romance fiction, women's fiction is probably the most famous fiction oh, out there. Yeah. And, and we're all uh, members of Romance Writers of Australia. It's the biggest feminist writing collective I have ever been involved with. Oh, that sounds exciting. Yeah, get on it. Get it. Get, yeah, if anyone wants to write any kind of fiction, I would say that's always my advice to join them because let's say that presented it before. Every book has romance in. I have the argument to my sons. Harry Potter's got romance. Wimpy Kids got romance. And we, we're romance. women writing about women's lives. We're published by women. Uh, my lovely publishers yeah. over there. Um, <laughs> the company's led almost. Number two is a woman. The <laughs> editors are women. The people who sell our books into the bookstores are women. I mean, you know. Yeah, that, okay. that is the circle. Of, it's the circle of life. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. It is of what I'm interested too in um, has conversations around sexuality changed too. Is there a role now in romantic fiction for, um, you know, stories that are more non binary? Kind of love relationships or two women or uh, they're, they're yeah. extremely popular and have been around for quite a long time now yeah, yeah. Mm. absolutely right yeah. the one question i wanted to ask before we go to questions was about um as i was talking about being gender fluid um because you all have sort of these books have moved from um romantic fiction to perhaps um, women's fiction um, it's about being genre fluid. Is there, is it, you know, have we moved past having to categorise writing into genres? And ha where do you, you know, as a writer, you know, is that, you know, as a promise to a reader, like when you move, you know, does it change in what you write and who you write for? So I've written mostly rural romance until the last couple of years, and I changed into sort of relationship stories, but not necessarily romance. Um, and most of my readers, you know, it's always a worry, oh, are they going to, do they only read rural romance and I'm going to lose them or am I going to, and most of them also read crime and read my books and, and stuff too. Um, but what I think, so the readers, I think readers are completely open about reading whatever and I think it's the perception out there, um, sadly, um, I don't want to say this now, but yeah, the literary community, festivals, um, sadly, some bookshops and things like that, they will be like, for me, I'll always be a romance writer, and that's fine. I've written romance, I love writing romance, I'll probably write it again, but I also write other stuff. Um, and I think so, people do tend to box you into a certain um, genre. And I don't think, I mean. Have you ever been to a bookshop and seen yourself in a weird genre? <laughs> uh, yes, I'm not sure what it was, but yes, I have. They put me in self help once. <laughs> <laughs> I pity that person. <laughs>
wants men out of it mm. too, but they're trying to target the the oh, women's so. readership. I so much don't think that like romance is a problem or crime's a problem or thriller. I think women's fiction is that that yeah, particular true. name is the problem because um, one, there's many men that read women's fiction. Uh, two, it, we've talked about how it sort of diminishes it. Oh, that's just women's business. But the other thing is, it doesn't tell you anything. If I, if I, people ask me, oh, what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm an author. What do you write? If I say romance, they know. If I say women's fiction, they're like, oh. Yeah, there's no men's fiction section. Also, it doesn't so it's fiction. Fiction. <laughs> men's fiction is either crime or thriller or literary, but that's even a weird term too. So it's very, yeah, it's hard. Some are really good because they tell you specifically, but then the ones that don't. Uh, look, I think we do understand that there's a shorthand about those definitions in publishing and especially the booksellers. You know, I'm great to drive. My favourite bookshop in Adelaide, I walk up and I know where the crime section is and it helps me with that idea about there's there's probably 50,000 books in the store. I mean, I want to, you know, go to my section. So, you know, it's, that's part of the... Part it of is. Part of finding the audience. Really. Yeah. Yeah, it is. But I think you're right. Women's section needs to go and it needs a new name. I call what I write life lit. Now, someone said another thing the other day because it's it's not historically set, so it's con they're contemporary fiction about things that we can all relate to in a current modern day sort of... That's what I'm trying to get going. Life lit. Life lit's good. Do you like life lit? Yeah. Lit sounds a little bit like lit, but that's all right. <laughs> that would say some of our erotic at all. Yeah. I know. <laughs> in life lit, no. <laughs> <laughs> we have two sections, life lit and life lit. Same <laughs> though. <laughs> oh, that is genre food. <laughs> Thank you. 
you don't really set a question that you can case anyone in here. I'm just wondering what influence, influenced us to become writers in this genre. Uh, I was obsessed with Georgette Hare as a young teenager, and uh, I, when I came to write, they said, write what you love to read. So I thought, oh, these look easy, I'll have a go at that. And I didn't realise there's a massive market for those kinds of books in the US. So I got my first publishing deal with a New York publisher, and uh, went from there. Um, well, as I said, I didn't, hadn't read romance and did a literary fiction writing degree, which was totally not me. But the reason I did it is because, remember that boy that I was stalking in <laughs> high school? Um, I accidentally dumped him. You can accidentally dump someone as well as get accidentally pregnant. And anyway, I accidentally dumped him in my, towards the end of year 12, and I was absolutely heartbroken and thought my life was over, as 17 year old emotional girls do. And for some reason, as I said, I wasn't a big reader or writer, I started writing this book. And it was absolutely terrible. It was 80,000 words of what we'd said to each other in the like five years of high school. And most of the time he was running the other direction away from me. Um, and so, but it was so bad. But even then I sort of understood that you can't end a book by accidentally dumping someone. So I gave him a horrific disease and I killed him off. <laughs> and so it started as therapy for me, I think. And I've heard actually a lot of people in a more serious fashion that writing starts as therapy. But so it took me a while to sort of find my niche. Um, as I said, I, I sort of thought, okay, I want to be a writer now because that was fun. I'm going to go and do a writing degree at uni. Uh, but that was sort of, it took me a while. I found reading again. I loved it. I found Bridget Jones' Diary, all those kind of things. I was reading that as well as other things I needed to read. Um, but then it took me sort of a, a long while before I sort of gave myself permission to write what I loved to read rather than what I thought I should be reading. And back then I was living in a small um, rural community in Western Australia. And I'd been writing for Mills and Boone for a while, um, or trying to, and not getting anywhere. And my friend said, why don't you write a rural romance? Because it was suddenly becoming sort of a big thing. And I, I was not a farmer, I was not married to a farmer. We were just there because my husband was a supermarket manager at the time. And so I felt a bit of a fraud, but I love small towns and communities. I really fell in love with it. I call myself a converted country girl. And I love the dynamics of everyone knowing everything about everyone else. Sometimes that's good, sometimes it's bad. So I decided to focus on that and it was, when I decided, you know, I'm not going to write necessarily for publication, but I'm just going to try and do something that I really love and have fun with, that's the book that finally got me published. Um, I didn't start writing, I, I, well, actually, when I was 15, I had a, oh no, actually, I might start again. When I was 15, uh, my English teacher, who's, his name is Peter Garland Thomas, in that way, um, got us all to write a short story in class, and without us knowing, he sent them off to Women's Weekly. Sorry, Woman's Day, Woman's Day. And it was a very different magazine back in 1980. It was um, not like, it's a, well, not gossipy like it is now. There was, um, and I've got the, so he sent them off. Mine was chosen to be published. And I've got $100. Wow. I've got to tell you, freelance writers these days get 100 bucks for a story as well. So, <laughs> not great. So, um, that really, that was the first time anyone had ever, I, I found that validation from writing. I've always been an, an avid book one of my loved to read. And so I thought, but back then, I, I didn't know what it was to be a writer. And I, I come from a very working class migrant background. No one I knew in my family had been to university. They didn't have creative writing degrees back then, so I'm like I'm ancient. Um, so I, but I loved words, so I, um, I became a journalist. Um, and that was, and I put away that dream of being a writer for a very long time until I had a midlife crisis when mm -hmm. I was, you know, 45 or something. And I thought, if I don't start and try to pursue this dream I've had now, it will pass me by. And so I did some courses at um, the Writers' Centre in South Australia, and um, then was, re was recommended to me to join Romance Writers, and it's the best thing I did, because it's, you go there for a week, a, a weekend every year, and do workshops about writing, and meet other authors. And um, but that, Why did I pick that genre? Because I, I enjoy reading it. And I, I'm a bit rebellious, and I, I hate being told what I should read as well. You know, there's a lot of that in in the publishing world as well, and, and it's and the way books are promoted. But this is really important, and you should read it. And I go, ah, read that then. <laughs> I, I, this, you know, it's pretty. I've got a stubborn streak as well, so mm. it's kind of a long story. But I, I was reading um, things that I, I was. I tried to write something that I wanted to read myself. I think if anyone in the audience who wants to be a writer, write what you want to read 
because the reader will feel your passion in it. If you're trying to, you know, I'm going to whip off the mills and boon this, this weekend, people can tell that your heart's not in it. So that's yeah. why long story. Can I just right. finish? Um, thank you. Peace to you, too, mate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we do that, we peace on here a lot still. Let's get peace on later. Yeah. Um, I, I just like to close the session then um, with each of you um, quickly because I've got too, I've got too much two pieces of time to go. Um, <laughs> telling us very quickly, and it's very quick, why you wrote this book. Start with you, Victoria, and we'll work down to that. I wrote this book to tell the story of my mother's migration journey to Australia and to honour all the migrants who've come before whose stories have never been told. <laughs> the Juliet Code to bring to light the amazing, courageous, smart women who uh, parachuted into France behind enemy lines in World War II. Yes. 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 I'm very, very bad at keeping concise sentence, but I guess I wrote this book to educate myself and other people about something I didn't know much about, which was egg donation. Thank you. Thank you very much to the Street Fathers writers, to Rachel Johns, to Chris Kinder, to Victoria Permit. They will be in the signing set now. Go get yourself a book that fabulous reads. You'll love them. Thank you. Thank you. I'm waiting for that line, too. <laughs>